What's up, guys? If you're not subscribed, please subscribe. Also, please smash that like button on the video and enjoy the show. But yeah. do you think part of that is a little bit of that ivory tower of, well, the guy you're talking about with Eric Weinstein is is a, he's a mathematician. He's not even a physicist. So they don't want to, quote unquote, waste their time no, with it. They know you don't think no, that's no. it? No, Eric, Eric's a, a, a dominant, you know, force in the intellectual, you know, intellectual sphere. No, I don't think that's, that's true at all. He, do, he will, I'll get frustrated with him because he'll often say, oh, I'm just a mathematician. But in reality, I mean, he's claiming to impinge upon the traditional pathways of modern physics, including that of, you know, uh, of maybe pre-discovering certain even foundational equations that have led to, you know, the so-called string revolution and other things while he was a graduate student. And there's documentation about this from his thesis. No, he he traffics in, in physics. It's just highly mathematical physics, mm. which is fine. I mean, mathematicians have been – or physicists have been contributing to mathematics since, you know, long before, you know, Alexander of Samos and, you know, yeah. uh, there there's uh, – or Aristotle. There, there are, you know, obviously Isaac Newton, you know, Cohen discovered calculus or invented calculus depending on how you think about it. Significant overlap for sure. Yeah. Huge part of it. But if, if you had to explain to like – the layman out there to get at the core of what we've been coming around to with like the the Kaku camp and like the Weinstein camp. Like, w what is string theory in your estimation, and what is it that Eric is proposing with geometric unity? I think there's a there's a misguided um, fascination, focus, obsession in some sense with um, with string theory. String theory has gotten a tremendous amount of attention, and this is sociological, perhaps, uh, and and possibly because of the authority bias that's that's always present when you have a field. As um, there, there's no there's no telling how much respect people have for mathematics and physics, and I'm talking about intellectuals. So there was a famous Japanese poet who won the Nobel Prize in literature. And he told his mother, and his mother said, "Well, that's great, but I thought uh, I always thought you'd be a physicist." <laughs> you know, she was disappointed. Like he's one of you know a hundred people still alive, or, or even fewer, right? So you think about like what is the pinnacle of human brain power? It's typically a math, and I'm I'm not a mathematician. I'm not tooting my own horn. I'm an experimental physicist, which is several levels down in the public's estimation. Mm. Who do you know as a physicist? Well, just around the corner, Brian Greene, Jan Eleven. Um, as I said, Stephen Wolfram, Stephen Hawking, you know, the names that people know, Lenny Susskind, all these people I've had on. I've had 14 Nobel Prize winners in physics alone on my podcast, plus several others from other disciplines. They're almost all theoretical physicists, mm -hmm. which is as close to math as you can get in physics. Um, what I feel is missing from all these discussions, from all these series, is a recognition that they are, for some reason, uh, putting the cart before the horse, or in my case, I call this the the, the toe before the gut, and it's it's a hilarious pun. Trust me, Julian. Um, so there's something in physics called unification. Unification is the recognition that seemingly disparate phenomena, like electricity, you know, lightning bolts, static cling, and what have you, and magnetism, the stuff of uh, of refrigerator magnets and levitating trains, that those are actually two sides of the same coin called electromagnetism, mm. and they're actually different manifestations. And this is a key insight in Einstein's special theory of relativity. It was understood by, uh, by uh, James Clerk Maxwell, who laid the foundations for modern mathematical physics of, of electrodynamics and many other things, that actually an observer in motion, so let's say you, you see a charge here. There's just a static charge that's just sitting there. You and I see it, we're static, and we see it as producing an electric field that radiates away from a positive charge or converges on a negative charge. That's a convention, right? Uh, and yet, uh, if you have somebody sliding by on a train, you know, down the street, they will see that charge in motion. Mm. How do you reconcile those two things? And by the way, a charge in motion produces what's called a current. Currents are the sources of magnetic fields. So how can you reconcile those two things with the statement that motion is relative? There's no such thing as absolute velocity. You and I can't say that someone in a car, and you've had this experience, you're sitting on a train at, at you know, Penn Station, the train next to you starts to move, you're like, oh, we're moving? No, you're not moving, you're stationary. Mm. No one can tell 
when an observer or a uh, participant is in relative constant motion. They can't say that you're in relative constant motion. They can only say, according to me, you're in motion with some velocity in some direction. Are you talking, I, I want to make sure just for people who are following, are you talking about the difference in what I can see if like you physically saw me running versus me sitting on the train and you only saw me sitting on the train, you didn't see the train itself moving? At constant velocity, it almost doesn't make a difference. If you're carrying a charge, then somebody running at the same speed as you would see that charge being static and therefore only producing mm. a static electric field. However, me sitting on the ground, lazily sipping my delicious coffee, I would see you moving with a charge, therefore you'd be producing a current. Therefore, I would see that you're going to produce a magnetic field, mm. not an electric field. There would be no electric field. There'd be an electric magnetic field. What Maxwell realized is that uh, is that those are two sides of the same coin. Electricity, one, one man's electric field is another man's magnetic field, mm. okay? So what's so important about that is that there was a unification. There actually one thing called the electromagnetic field. When did he come up with that? 1850s, 1860s. Okay. Um, he died very young, like it's 40 years old. <laughs> yeah, he's been. Um, and then even he, as brilliant as he was, he thought that these waves traveled through a medium called the ether, that was uh, mm. rejected 50 or 60 years later. But, but essentially, he didn't understand how he could have a wave of light or electromagnetism, which he also discovered. How could you have a wave traveling through a vacuum where there's no medium? There's no such, we, we're talking now, there's sound waves emanating from pressure and density perturbations that get picked up by a little diaphragm. Pressure and density what? Va variations or vibrations. Oh, yeah. Okay. yeah perturb oh, perturbations. Perturbations. Yeah, perturbations. Like, what the fuck is yeah. that? <laughs> that's a, some of the things you can't, that sound dirty, but are not. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go per <laughs> perturbate myself later on. Uh, so when you think about how um, you know how these things are two sides of the same coin, the same thing exists with nuclear physics and particle physics mm. and quantum mechanics. Thank you for watching the video, guys. Please hit that subscribe button and check out this clip's full podcast episode by clicking here or in the description below.